Welcome to Electron Online and now we're going to do the same problem we did in the previous video except this time we're trying to find the time that it will take for the electron to move from the origin to a point at a distance b away from the alpha particle. Remem remember the alpha particle was nailed in place right here on the x-axis at distance a from the origin. The electron starts at the origin, it's let go and the electron will fly towards the alpha particle because the force of attraction is very strong and we want to know how long it will take to go from this location to this location a distance b away from the alpha particle. Remember that the velocity that we calculated when it reaches this point was equal to this right there but then I made a small change to that. Remember that the charge of an alpha particle will be twice the charge of, a, of an electron so I wrote that down right here the charge of an alpha particle is twice the charge of an electron and so therefore we can put the answer in terms of the velocity, in terms of the uh, unit charge on the electron, again remembering that electrons are indeed negatively charged but we just simply want the magnitude of that. So that would be the velocity in our previous answer uh, based upon what we did. Now it turns out we're going to have to do some of this work over again because uh, what we cannot do is use the end velocity. We know that the velocity is constantly increasing. We also know that the distance equals velocity times time, which means the time is equal to the distance divided by the velocity, which is equal to how far it's gone so far divided by the velocity. But remember that the velocity is not constant. It varies continuously. So in order to find the total time, we're going to have to integrate. We're going to have to find out how long it takes to go from there to there in small, little, infinitesimally pieces. For example, we can say, if we write it like that, that the, uh, that the amount of time that went by to go, for example, from this location to this location, for the small amount of distance covered, the amount of time spent doing that, we can write that as dt, which is going to be equal to the amount of distance that we covered, which is dx, divided by the velocity at that particular location, which means we need to find the velocity as a function of x, which means we need to solve the amount of work done as a function of x to be able to calculate the velocity there. So let's do this first. Let's find the work done as a function of x, so it's the same uh, integral as we did in the previous video, which is going to be kqx uh, divided by the distance between <clears throat> a minus x is going to be a minus x, which is the distance between the electron and the alpha particle. So let's go ahead and do that integral. We have the proper differential right here, but now the limits are from 0 to x, not from 0 to the end position right there. So that will allow us to find the work done uh, at a particular position for the electron, and then we can find the velocity at that particular position as a function of x. So we have the integral here, which is uh, the work as a function of x is equal to minus k little q big q, and again we're going to write that as uh, twice the electron charge uh, times the integral right here, which would be a minus x to the minus 1 power uh, divided by the new exponent, which is minus 1, and evaluated from 0 to x. So this negative cancels out that negative, and then we can write this as uh, 2 k times the electron charge squared, because that would be charge times charge, the electron charge squared, and q is twice little q, so we get the 2 from there. And then here we can write this as uh, 1 over a minus x to the first power evaluated from 0 to x. When we plug in the upper limit, we get the following. This is equal to 2k uh, electron charge squared times 1 over a minus x, because when we plug in the upper limit, we still get x. When we plug in the lower limit, we get minus 1 over a. So now we have the work done as a function of x. We can probably simplify that just a little bit. So we can write this as, uh, uh, this is equal to 2k times the electron charge squared times, when we combine the, that over the common denominator, we'll get a minus a minus x in the numerator divided by a times a minus x. And now right away you see that the a's cancel out, the minus times the minus becomes a plus, so this is equal to 2ke squared times x divided by a times a minus x. All right, so now we have redone, we have recalculated the work done to get an electron from here to any position x closer to the alpha particle. And now we can use that to find the velocity as a function of x because remember that the velocity can be found by using the equation for kinetic energy. We can say that the kinetic energy is equal to one half 
mv squared, which is equal to the work done to get it there as a function of x, which means we can then write the velocity. Velocity is equal to the square root of 2 times the work done as a function of x divided by the mass of the electron. So now we have the velocity as a function of x when we plug in the work done as a function of x, which is what we have over there. Okay, let's do that. So uh, the velocity, therefore, is equal to the square root of 2 times the work done, which is times 2, which is ke squared, times x divided by the mass. And then in the denominator, we also get a times a minus x. Let's see if I got that right. Make sure we got x over a times a minus x, which is right here. We got 2 times 2. K squared e, K e squared divided by the mass. I think we're good to go. And then since K is 1 over 4 pi epsilon sub naught, the 2's will cancel. And so we can say this is equal to the square root of uh, E squared times X divided by uh, the 4's will cancel. I get pi epsilon sub naught times M times A times A minus X. And so now we have an equation for the velocity. And, of course, I'm going to need that in this equation right here to find the time in just a moment. And then one more thing we could do, we can factor out everything that's a constant. We know a, m, epsilon sub naught, pi, and e squared all constants. So that means that this becomes velocity as a function of x is equal to the square root of e squared divided by pi, epsilon sub naught, m times a, times the square root of x over a minus x. And so since this is a constant, when we integrate, we only have to worry about this portion right there. So I think we're in pretty good shape. And I'm going to call this whole thing just a constant to make things simpler. So this is equal to C1, I'll call it C1, times the square root of x divided by a minus x. So this is now the velocity of the, of the electron as it flies towards the alpha particle in terms of x. Now we can go ahead and find the time by using this equation right here. So we can say that dt is equal to dx over the velocity. And so therefore, dt is equal to uh, d, uh, let's see here, dx divided by the velocity. That would be divided by this quantity right here. That would be um, divided by c1 times the square root of x over a minus x. And finally, we can then say that dt is equal to uh, 1 over c1 times the quantity of the square root of a minus x divided by the square root of x times dx. I'm not ready to integrate, but I'm beginning to run out of board space. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to erase all of this, but the one thing I want to remember is that c1 was equal to this portion right here underneath the integral sign. So let me uh, underneath the radical. So c1 was equal to... Uh, the square root of that, and 1 over c1, 1 over c1 was the inverse of that, so that's equal to the square root of this thing reverse, which is pi epsilon sub naught uh, times m times a divided by e squared. So I want to keep that, and I want to get rid of all this. All right, continuing, now to have a little bit more board space, let's do this. So now I want to know that t is equal to the integral of dt, which is equal to uh, 1 over c1 times the integral of the square root of a minus x divided by the square root of x dx. Okay, how do I integrate that? Well, I'm going to need to make some substitutions. So let's start with let u equals the square root of a minus x. Maybe instead of writing it as a square root, I'll write it like this. So how about a minus x to the one half power? That's a little bit better. So let's take the derivative of that. That means that du dx is equal to 1 half times a minus x to the minus 1 half power times minus 1 from inside the parentheses. Uh, so it means that uh, du is equal to minus 1 over 2 times a minus x to the 1 half power times dx. So therefore, since we have a dx here, I'm going to solve that for dx so we can say that dx is equal to minus 2 move the mon across, move that across, times a minus x to the one-half power du. And since 
this quantity right here, a minus x to the 1 half, is equal to u. I could write that dx is equal to minus 2 times u times du. All right, I think I'm now ready to start substituting that into my integral right here. So we can say that the time is equal to, and of course, what are the limits? We're going to integrate from 0 to x, right? Uh, actually, from 0 to this location right here. And the location would be, uh, let's see, x equals a minus b. So it would be integral from 0 to a minus b. Um, I still have my 1 over c1. Can't forget that. That's still there. Times the integral of this cannot be written as u. dx can be written as minus 2u du. And the square root of x, hmm, let's see here. What can I do there? See, I need to find something here. So what I can do here is I can take this and square both sides. That will give me u squared is equal to a minus x. From here, I can write that x is equal to a minus u squared. And therefore, I can write that the square root of x is equal to the square root of a minus u squared. All right, that's better. I can now replace the square root of x by the square root of a minus u squared. Now, I'm almost there. I'm going to take the minus 2 out. I have a u squared du divided by this. That almost looks like an integral I'm familiar with. At least I can look up in an integral table. But I don't like the a here. That's a single constant. I'm going to make one more substitution. I'm going to write that um, a is equal to c sub 2. Uh, no, not c sub 2. How about c squared? That's better. c squared. Let's make that substitution. And so moving all that out, so we have the time is equal to 1 over, not 1, I'm going to take the minus 2 out. So minus 2 over c1 times the integral from 0 to a minus b of u squared du divided by the square root of c squared minus u squared. Now that is an integral that we can find easily in any integral table. Okay, I, uh, I actually did erase a little bit off the board to give myself more room because I was pinning myself into a very narrow, narrow picture here. So I need a little bit more space to finish up this problem. So now we're ready to integrate here. So let's go ahead and do that. We still have the minus 2 over c1 for the constant. And when we integrate this, we get an, inter an interesting result. This is equal to um, minus u over 2 uh, times the square root of c squared minus u squared. Right? And then would be plus, yeah, that would be uh, uh, c squared over 2 times the arc sine of... It would be u over c squared. There we go. And then we still have our limits of integration, which is from 0 to a minus b. All right. I believe that's the correct integral. Uh, let's see here. That would be um, minus u over 2, c squared minus u squared to the 1 half, plus c squared over 2, arc sine of u over c squared. All right. Now we're ready to continue. Now, before we plug in the limits, of course, since these are x limits, we have to convert these back to, um, to x's instead of u's. And also notice that the 2 will cancel out. So this 2 cancels out these 2's. That becomes 1. And this minus will make that a plus, and will make this a minus, like that. All right. So now let's go ahead and plug in the limits. Plug in the upper limit. We get this is equal to, and let me move right up here. So it would be uh, 1 over c1. Remember, 1 over c1 is equal to that quantity right there. Let's not forget about that. Times uh, u is not going to be replaced by, where are we here? Uh, since u squared is equal to this, u would be the square root of that. So that would be the square root of a minus x. And then the square root of c squared minus u squared. Remember, c squared is equal to a, so that would be the square root of a minus u squared, and u squared is a minus x, so a minus a is 0, and a minus times a minus is a plus x. So I can go ahead and just plug, plug that in like that. Okay, so now we plug in for u, we plugged in the square root of a minus x, and for c squared, we plug in a, and for u squared, we plug in a minus x, so a minus a, that disappears, and a minus times a minus x is the plus x. So far, so good. Okay, now minus. 
Here we have c squared over 2. Well, the 2 is gone, so that's c squared. And remember that c squared is equal to a, so I get an a times the arc sine of u, which is equal to the square root. Where are we here? Uh, u is equal to the square root of a minus x squared. Uh, uh, so it would be a minus x quantity to the 1 half power. And we divide that by c squared, and c squared is equal to a. So divide by a. And that would be evaluated. The limits are still from 0 to a minus b. Now we plug in the upper limit. 1 over c1. We plug in the upper limit. We get, instead of x, we write a minus b. So a minus a, that disappears. We have minus times the minus b becomes the square root of positive b times the square root of a minus b minus a times the arc sine of, plug in the upper limit, a minus an a minus b, that would be the square root of b divided by a. That's when we plug in the upper limit. And now when we subtract, when we plug in the lower limit, plug in 0 for x here, this goes to 0. So all that happens is when we plug in 0 there, I get the square root of a over a. So it would be uh, minus times a minus, or plus uh, a times the arc sine of, that would be the square root of a over a. All right, now we could leave it like that, but it turns out, notice that this is the square root of b over a, which is a relatively small number because b is smaller than a, and the square root of b much, must be a lot smaller than a, and the square root of a over a should also be a small number. And for small numbers, it's okay to combine this because the sine of the angle is approximately equal to the angle for small numbers. So what we could do is we can combine this and notice that this is plus, that is minus. So this minus this becomes square root of a minus square root of b over a. And so we can say that this can be now written as 1 over c1 times the square root of b times the square root of a minus b. And that would be plus this minus this. So it would be plus a times the arc sine of, and we can combine these numbers. And so it would be the square root of a minus b divided by a, like that. And then, of course, we can replace 1 over c by what that is equal to. So this is equal to the square root of pi epsilon sub naught times ma, all divided by electric charge squared times the square root of b times the square root of a minus b plus a times the arc sine of the square root of a minus b, whoop, minus b, all divided by the square root of a. And again, this is an approximated value, assuming that um, square root of b and square root of a are relatively small compared to a. And I just realized that I don't need the square root there because there was no square root on the a. So just simply over a instead of over square root of a. So and that would be the answer for that problem. So quite an involved problem. Uh, it gives you an interesting view of how you can utilize Coulomb's law to calculate such things as how fast will the electron be moving as it moves closer to an alpha particle and how long will it take for the electron to get there. In both cases, we have to integrate because both force and, time and velocity vary as the electron moves across towards the alpha particle. But that's how we do that.